250 in your hymnal, 250, there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Would you stand with me as we sing 250? On that first, there's within my heart a melody. singing good to see you in church this morning and uh, middle of summer and uh, appreciate your faithfulness to be here and looking forward to a good lord's day together let's open with a word of prayer shall we father we bow before you in prayer we thank you for another opportunity that's ours to gather together here in your house and lord we we thank you for a great salvation that we have in our savior jesus christ thank you for so loving us that you would give your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I pray that in all things Christ would have the preeminence here this morning, that he would be lifted up, and as he's lifted up, draw all of us closer to him, please. If any in this room has never received Christ as their Savior, I pray that they'd receive him today. And Lord, I pray those of us who know him as Savior would be drawn closer to him and be more like him, and desire him more because we were in church this morning. So, Lord, use the service, control it, make it exactly what you desire it to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 304 in your hymnal, 304. <clears throat> I'm only a sinner saved by grace. We'll sing that first, second, and last together. Not have I gotten but what I received. Grace has bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be.
now a couple of announcements for us. Listen carefully if you would. Uh, regular schedule today, 5.30. We have a Christian growth class open to anyone who'd like to come. And uh, tonight's lesson is going to be on the spirit versus the flesh. The spirit versus the flesh. You find out that once you're saved, uh, the spirit of God takes up residence inside your body. And your spirit is to listen to his spirit. Is he's going to tell you what God wants and how God wants you to live. But there's this old nature we have, and the Bible calls it the flesh, and those two are against each other, and it's always that battle. Well, how can I win the battle? How can I not do what the flesh wants, but do what God wants? Uh, we'll teach you that this evening uh, in the 530 spiritual growth class, all right? And then 630 will be the evening service right back here in the auditorium, and tonight, Lord willing, I want to talk to you about why, why should I belong to a New Testament Baptist church? What's the big deal anyway? And uh, I'm going to talk to you about that this evening, okay? And uh, from the Bible, uh, how and why it's important for you to belong uh, to a New Testament Baptist church, all right? And uh, again, congratulations to the Linkies on the arrival of Ezekiel David, uh, born Monday night, July 11th at 8.31 p.m., uh, weighing in at 6 pounds, 2 ounces, and 19 inches long. And uh, he is a cute little guy. And uh, those of you at the shower yesterday got to see him and a uh, little uh, bundle that he is. And uh, congratulations to Brett and Lisa. That's great. All right. He's got three boys. He's on his way to his own basketball team. <laughs> Just a couple more to go, and he'll have a starting five. All right. And uh, that's great. Well, let's take a moment and let's welcome our guests that are with us today. We're always glad when folks visit with us in the service, and if you're visiting this morning or if you brought a guest with you, we'd love to meet you, find out who you are and where you're from, and would you honor us just for a second by standing, introduce your guests. If you brought a guest with you, introduce them for us. Would you do that? Don't be bashful. That's all right. Got one back here. You, she don't want to stand. You can stand up and introduce her. Robert? Great. Julie, good to have you this morning again. Thank you for being here. Susan, introduce your, your son and his friend, will you? That's great. Good to have Nathan and Ken visiting from Texas, the great state of Texas. Amen. The great, great, uh, maybe, maybe soon to be the great country of Texas. We'll see. And, uh, and uh, that's great. Good to have you. Thanks for making the trip up to, to be here this morning. All right. Anyone else today we may have missed? All right. If you'll take just a moment and fill out the Welcome card there. We appreciate you doing that. We'll have a record of your visit with us. And in a little bit, we have the offering. Just place that card in the plate and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. This morning, we're glad you're here. Let's give them a warm welcome, shall we?
Would you turn with me to 463, please, in your hymnal? 463, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. 463, on that first. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of us shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called of yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called of yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called of yonder i'll be there when the As we sing this last stanza, let's have the children be dismissed. For junior church children, you're dismissed on that last. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to set. And when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called of yonder, I'll be there. Let's go to 492, 492, Jesus Christ is made to me, all I need, all I need. Would you stand with me as we sing 492 together? Jesus Christ is made to me, all I need, all I need, he Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing those last stanzas together.
third, he's the treasure of my soul. He's the treasure of my soul. All I need, all I need, he hath cleansed and made me whole. He is all I need. together when we get to the course we'll have uh, the pianist drop out on that last glory glory to the lamb all i need all i need by his spirit sealed i am he Be seated. Ushers will come and we'll get our offering here this morning. Give as the Lord has blessed and prospered you. Remember, um, the first Sunday of August, uh, we'll have the special offering uh, for the carpeting, and uh, we're going to be getting all the light fixtures changed over, hopefully, uh, to the new LED bulbs. It'll uh, a great, great savings and uh, money wise. Um, uh, we're going to lord willing try and get the fellowship hall changed out as well those for your information the the bulbs in the fellowship hall when we turn them on are uh at least a dollar every minute they're on so uh when you just go in and decide to flip the light on out there remember that would you and uh it's about a dollar every minute but when we get that changed over it will be pennies every minute it's a big difference and so it'll we'll, we'll realize the difference in the monthly bills uh, when we get it all changed over, but there is an initial outlay in getting things switched over to that. But uh, that'll be uh, what the offering on August the 7th will go towards, okay? Let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our giving this morning. Father, we thank you again for uh, you being such a great God. And Lord, we... Uh, come here today expecting to hear from you, but Lord, we're going to need your help to, um, Lord, to uh, humble ourselves and to uh, listen closely to what you got for each and every one of us. And Father, we ask that uh, the Holy Spirit will be in full control of the speaker and all of the hearers. Lord, now we ask that you bless this offering. Lord, may be people be praying about what they should give in the special offering, Lord, that we may uh, spend your money wisely and, and do that which is, is wise. And, Lord, I just uh, want to thank you again for what you're going to do in this service. And, Lord, we uh, give you all the thanks and praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would, please, and go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. <clears throat> James 4, we'll read verses 1 through 12 of James chapter 4. We'll begin together on verse 1, and then I'll read 2. We'll alternate like that till we finish on verse number 12. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of James chapter 4. Ready? From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And Let's end with verse 12 together as well. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible, and thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have copies of the scripture with us today. And Lord, I pray that each of us will be ready to give our careful attention to the only book that you've ever written. And I pray, Lord, that you would open our understanding and that each of us would be listening to what you would want to say to each of our hearts through the message today. Now, Father, bless the special this morning and prepare us to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. My heart bowed in shame 
Father, we thank you this morning for Calvary and that Calvary certainly covers it all. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that cleanses us from all sin. And Father, we bow before you now as we open up your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to listen to the word of God today. And I pray, the Spirit of God, that you would move up and down these rows and in and out of these aisles and you'd stop at every occupied seat and you'd minister to your people this morning as only you can. And I pray that your will, God, would be done in, ev- in each and every heart and life. And the Lord, each one could leave in a little bit saying, it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. God spoke to my heart. So Lord, we thank you for the music and thank you for the fellowship. But Lord, we pray that you'll use and honor the teaching and the preaching of your word now to accomplish what you desire in each one of our lives. Help me as I bring the message and help each individual as they listen. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The question in James 4, if your Bible's still open there, the question that James asked uh, almost 2,000 years ago is a question that's still being asked today. What's the source of all the fights and the conflicts? We see it all over, not just in America, but all over the world now. And everybody wonders, what is the problem? Why the killing? Why the murder? Why the violence? Why, by the way, it's not only in our society and in among nations, but it's in our homes as well. Violence among families. Violence among husbands and wives. Violence even among friends. Why are we, why, why, why human beings are so prone to conflict and seem to be acting out on it now more than ever before? You can find an excuse or a reason to pick a fight or be in conflict about anything. There's conflict among the nations, and obviously, there's conflict among religions. 
conflict among races, conflict among political parties and political entities within the parties. There's even conflict in churches. You haven't been saved very long probably, or if you've been saved anywhere 10 to 20 years, you've been part of conflict in the church. How many have been saved more than 20 years? Let me see your hand. All right. How many of you have seen conflict in churches? I think everybody's hand went back up. See, uh, they, they, where's that come from? James deals with that here, but he doesn't just deal with where's the conflict coming from, but he deals with uh, what, what we should do about it. What I like about the Bible is it doesn't just point out the problem, it'll give you the solution to the problem. And so it's not just pointing out what's wrong, it's going to tell us how we can correct the wrongs. And I want you to look here, first of all, in James 4, and it, where James gives us the source of our conflict. The source of the conflict. Verse number 1, from whence come wars? Wars, there is, is, it means a disposition to be contentious. A, a disposition to want to fight. Okay? Where does that disposition come from? And the, the fightings is a striving for victory or a striving for conquest. Where does that desire to want to wanna, wanna fight somebody or want to have victory over somebody, want to conquer somebody, where's that coming from? Well, it says, where do those wars and fightings among you? They come, they, come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members. Now, lust is a, is a longing desire. It's, it's not just a desire to have something. It's an eagerness to possess it. So there's a, it's a it's, you could say it's, it's a little stronger than what we would use the word desire. Okay? Or we want something. This is a longing. This is a, a I'm going to get it. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to get it. That's a strong lust. And he says they come from lust that warn our members. So when he, he says, you, you lust in verse 2 and you have not, so what do you do if you, if you desire and you have a longing to get it and eagerness to get it and you don't get it, what do you do next? You kill and desire to have. And yet you still cannot obtain what you're looking for. So you fight and you war and yet you still don't have it. And so we see the source of the conflict, first of all, is just our selfish passions that are within us. They're universal desires. You know, when Adam and Eve sit in the garden, God said, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. All right? We know they didn't die physically, but we know their spirit died. And they became cut off from God. Okay? In fact, that, that, that literally happened, and then God physically made it happen. When, they, when He came down and met them, then He banished them from the garden. He banished them from the place where they, would, they used to walk with God. And you understand that up to that point of sin, Adam and Eve were completely dependent upon God for everything. Everything God, everything that they had, God supplied. They did not have to be concerned about anything else. God took care of them. But now that they've sinned against God, now they do not find everything they need in God. They become independent creatures. They're trying to satisfy their own desires. That desire that people have to be somebody. The desire that people have to have security. The desire that people have to be loved. To do something worthwhile with their life. And so instead of resting in the contentment that God would take care of them and God would supply all of their needs, now they're, they're, they enter into a struggle to find that meaning in life, to find that worthwhile, to find that work to do apart from God. And you can't find it there. It won't be found. So it's the, the, the lust that war in our members, but secondly, listen, it's also unfulfilled desires. It's not just the universal desires that we all have to be loved, to feel secure, to have something worthwhile to do, to feel a significance in life. But we have unfulfilled desires because the Bible says ye lust and ye have not. You, you cannot obtain and you have not. You fight and you war and you don't get it. 
And so we, when we don't get what we're looking for, we're, we're, we're trying to find that security. We're trying to find that, that we matter, that we're important. And we're looking to trying to find that anywhere but God. And we're frustrated because we don't find it. And that frustration just builds up until we decide let's fight to get it. Let's war to get it. In fact, we'll even kill to get it. And we lash out at people around us. We're willing to hurt and even to destroy to meet our need, to get our needs met. And so, after all, we're all competing for the same thing. So it just must be survival of the fittest. So we'll just go after one another. We envy what other people, what, we envy what we think other people have. You wouldn't believe the times if he would say, oh, I wish I could be like so-and-so. <laughs> and I happen to know the problem so-and-so has. And I want to say to them, hey, you, don't want to be, you wouldn't want to be in their shoes. No, you don't. But that, we, we always get envious of what we think other people have. We grieve we don't have it, and then we continue to struggle to find a way to get it. We have unfulfilled desires. Universal desires, unfulfilled desires. So we find out that that's the source of our conflict. And again, it all comes back to selfishness. It all comes back to pride. It all comes back to us. We want what we want. I want what I want. I, I, I. But then it's not only the sinful passions or the selfish passions, but then God says something interesting here. James writes, Ye have not because ye ask not. And then in verse 3, Will you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So he says, there's not just your, your selfish passions, but he said you have sinful prayers. Now the first one is, is not, not asking wrong, but the first one is just not asking at all. You understand, the greatest hindrance to prayer is pride. Because when you're proud, who are you asking for help? Nobody. I'll do it myself. I don't need anybody's help. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't need anybody. And boy, we're just, we're not going to, and certainly you're not going to pray. Because then you're admitting, I need help. I need God. And so, prayerlessness is just a symptom of man's independence of God. I'm going to do things my own way. I'm going to do things the way I want to do them. I'll decide what's best for me. I'm capable of running my own life. I'm capable of calling the shots. Oh, I might go to God for some big things, but this isn't a big thing. I can handle this. Ye have not because ye ask not. I think it was Dr. Ice that said, I think it's one of the saddest things if, if, in heaven would be if you get to heaven. He said, and God would take you to a room and open it up and there'd be all these wonderful things there. And you say, Lord, what are all these things? And he said, well, those are things I was wanting to give to you, but you never asked me. These are things that I was ready to give, but you didn't ask me. Prayers that we don't pray. And listen, as long as we're looking for fulfillment in life from anywhere, any other source than God, we're not going to find fulfillment. It's not going to happen. We're, 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 we're going after it the wrong way. You're never going to be content with who you are. You're not going to be content with what you have. You're not going to be content with where you're headed. And you're not going to be content with what you've done until you find that rest in God and that satisfaction in God. And until then, you'll be frustrated and you'll still lash out and hurt other people. Oh, let's make America great again. No, it'll never happen until America makes God great again. And if America doesn't make God great again, America's never going to be great. won't happen. So he says, you don't ask, you don't pray. And that's probably the, the biggest sin of everybody in the room. We don't pray like we ought. That's the, 
That's the struggle for most believers. I've been in the ministry for 34 years. I've never had ever had one person come to me and say, I, I, I got a problem. I pray too much. I've never had a wife or a husband come and say, we're having a marriage conflict. Well, what seems to be the problem at home? I've never had a husband say, much. my wife, she just spends too much time in prayer. That's our problem. Never had a wife say, my husband, he just prays all the time. Never had that issue. Prayerlessness, we ask not. But then, he said, okay, you ask, so then you remedy that, and you go to pray, you ask, you say, okay, I'm asking, but I'm not receiving. How come I'm not getting my prayers answered? He said, because you're asking amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. So in other words, you're asking for the wrong motive. You're asking for the wrong reasons. You're asking, God, God's not Santa Claus. God doesn't take your list and check it twice and then see if you've been naughty or nice. He doesn't do that. Didn't know you knew that hymn, did you? Instead of a prayer where you're saying, not my will, but thy will be done. Instead of uh, figuring out, Lord, what, what do you want me to ask you for? We ask for whatever we want. And we think, and let, let me help you with something, because we all get in the habit of doing this. Every time we pray, we want to end it in Jesus' name. In other words, we want to ask for whatever we want to ask for, and then we want to sign Jesus' name to the bottom of the check. Because we figure that will carry more weight than our name. Now listen, if I'm going to sign the bottom of your check, I better agree with what is written in that check. And if I'm going to ask Jesus to put his name to my prayer, I better be sure that I'm praying to, for something that Jesus would sign his name to. And if I don't, then I better not say in Jesus' name as a matter of, you know, when, when Jesus said, don't when you pray, don't use the vain repetitions. You know what the vain repetition is? It's words without thoughts. Words without thinking. You ever, you ever pray and find yourself just saying words and you're not really thinking about what you're saying? Your mind begins to go other places and you're still talking but your mind's not thinking about what you're saying? And sometimes we're not careful. We can just utter words that we're not having any thought behind them at all. And one of those is in Jesus' name. When we're what we just prayed for may not be what Jesus wants. How come we're putting his name on it? See, we have to be careful that what we're praying for is what God would want for us. And if not, if we don't know, we say, Lord, I'd like you to show me what your will is in this matter. But listen, your will be done, not mine. I want to, your, what, what he teaches in the model prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want your will to be done. You see, we, we, other than that, we, we struggle to get our own desires and our own wants and what we want and how we think God should work. And it only, listen, if God answered every one of those prayers, it would only encourage our independence. Yeah, we got, I got a genie right here, man. Every time I rub the lamp, I get what I want. God says, life's not about getting what you want. Life's about getting what I want for you. You know, I'm not sure a week or two, I'm, I'm working ahead on the radio programs for when we're on vacation, but we're going to spend some time in Philippians 1. And in Philippians 1, in verse number 21, Paul writes, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, don't answer out loud, but ask yourself this question, for to me to live is what? What are you going to put in there? Hmm? For to me to live is, is it the fulfillment of your desires? Something that you want? Something that you think is important? And by the way, those of you who said, well, no, 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 I, I'd put Christ in there. Listen, is it for me to live is to serve Christ? 
He didn't say that. He didn't say for to me to live is to preach Christ. He didn't say that either. For me, to me to live is to um, uh, just to be like Christ. He didn't say that either. He said, no, for to me to live is Christ. It's Him. And then, then whatever I receive from Him is okay. I just want Him. That's all that matters. Are you still struggling to meet your own needs? Fighting? Warring? Intending to crush the competition or hurt anybody who gets in the way because this is what I want? Or if you're learning to rest in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, that my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The source of the conflict is our, our passions, our pride, our prayerlessness. And I, I, I call it our prayer recklessness, <laughs> asking amiss. And that's where we are. Society, America as a society uh, 50 some years ago said, we don't want God. We don't want Him in our schools. We, we've got 50 years now. We've brought up a generation of young people that don't know God. Don't know the Bible. Don't know the things of God. And so the only way they know to get things is they fight and they war. And they don't want to submit to authority. They don't want anybody, nobody telling me what to do. And that includes God. You see, when I, when, I, when I say there's God and I was creation of God, listen, then there's someone greater than me who I'm accountable to. And I have to submit to Him. But if I just evolved and it's survival of the fittest, hey man, every man for himself. And we're reaping that. Does anybody, does anybody step back and say, okay, America, 56 years ago or 54 years ago, we kicked God out of everything. How's that working for us? Maybe we ought to consider bringing God back in the picture. Does anybody see that? So I see the source of our conflict. But then notice James talks about then the seriousness of compromising. The seriousness of compromise. Look at verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He said, you, you know how serious it is? It's spiritual adultery. It's, it's spiritual infidelity. Adultery occurs when a person looks outside the relationship of their marriage to get their emotional or physical needs met. Let me just pause here to say, you can commit emotional adultery as sure as you can physical adultery. So you got no business uh, getting in chat rooms on the internet. You've got no business getting involved in, in relationships and sharing things that you ought not to share with anyone but your spouse. That's emotional adultery. In other words, a third party gets added to a relationship that doesn't belong there. Now, wait a minute. So how does this fit in with spiritual adultery? Well, spiritual adultery happens when Christians look outside of their relationship with God to get their needs met. We look outside of our relationship with God to get our needs met. In fact, we invite the third party in to meet the needs. In this case, the third party is the world. Now, this is, this is not the globe, okay? It's the, it's the philosophies and the practices of the world the, that men apart from God have put into their lives. And we look at that and think, well, man, they seem like they're having a good time. They seem like they're happy. I, I ought to try that. We ought to go that way. But that's all, listen, those are all things that they've devised of their own because they're living without God. Why would I want to pattern that? Why would I want to go after that? They're against God. They're anti-God. When we crave acceptance from the world, we reject God. 
and we set ourselves against him as though he were the enemy. He said friendship with the world is enmity. You become the enemy of God. So it's infidelity, but it's also insensitivity. Notice verse 5. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? The Spirit of God dwells in you. When you receive Christ as your Savior, the God, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence inside your body. And He's there to help you. The word for Holy Spirit literally means one that's called alongside to help. You don't, you don't live the Christian life by trying harder. You live the Christian life by yielding to the one person of the Godhead who God gave you to help you. And then He, he gives you the ability to do that. And the, but here's the thing. The Spirit doesn't force Himself to take over. You yield yourself to Him. You yield yourself to His influence in your life. You know what it says? The spirit that dwells in us, he, he strongly desires to have that, that lust again. He, he, he eagerly wants to have an influence on us that he sees we give to other things. We allow other things to guide us and influence us and, and, and cause us to move to action. And we won't do the same thing for him. How insensitive that is. How hard is it? Listen, how hard is it, ladies, if you saw your husband be kind and nice and uh, re be real gentle to other ladies and then be mean and ugly and never listen to you? How would that work? Hmm? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't work so well, would it? You would easily become very jealous and you would get resentful. We would have feelings, obviously, the Spirit of God would not because He's the Spirit of God and we're human beings. But we understand that, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. I wonder how many times the Holy Spirit says, man, you're letting, you're letting that TV program have that kind of influence on you? You're letting those friends have that kind of influence on you? You're letting that, that drug or that alcohol have that kind of influence on you? You won't let me have that kind of influence. And we completely ignore the one who God has given to help us. When we look to any other source to meet our needs, we're treading on the feelings of our lifelong companion as a believer, the Holy Spirit of God. And we grieve the Spirit. And we quench the Spirit in our life. Now, that reveals something about us. Verse number 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the what, church? But giveth grace unto the humble. Talk about grace for a minute. Most Christians, you know, we, 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 we kind of grasp grace when it comes to salvation. Grace is God, God giving us what we don't deserve, and that's salvation. For by grace are you saved. Hey, hey why, did, why are you saved? Why, why did you hear the gospel? Why did you understand the gospel? Hey, we could have been born on the other side of the world and we'd all be Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim. You didn't choose to be born over here. That's the grace of God. It was the grace of God. Not only that, but what about your family? How many of you have immediate members of your family? I mean, I mean brothers or sisters or, a, or maybe even a mother and a father who don't know Christ as their Savior. How many are like that this morning? Okay. Why are you saved? Out of all the brothers or sisters, that, how come you accepted Christ? God's grace. You can't take credit for that, can you? Say, well, it's just because I'm the most intelligent. Well, I'm the best look. Well, now forget that one. <laughs> no. You know what? It's God's grace. And so we, we understand the grace of God and salvation. God's gracious to me, and, and, and I don't deserve it. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But then 
when it comes to God's grace after we're saved, we get kind of fuzzy. Listen, if, if salvation is God doing for me what I can't do for myself, isn't that grace? Where God has done all the work, I'm just trusting what He's done for me? Well, does grace change now that I'm saved? No, it's still God doing for me what I cannot do for myself. And that's live the Christian life. And allow me to live the Christian life. God's grace isn't just a cover-up for our failures or help us to get through difficult things, though His grace will help us to get through difficult things. It's God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's why He said He gives more grace. He's, he's ready to do everything for us that Adam and Eve lost in the garden. That's what God's ready to do. Now, the, what's the means of that grace coming to us? How does that help come to us? It comes to us when we're humble. It comes to us when we're humble. Who does He give grace to? The humble. Who are the humble? The people who admit they need help. Remember, the proud won't admit he needs any help. Everybody's had the experience with a little child and they're doing something and you know it's kind of difficult to do and you're there ready to help and you want to help them and you go to, go to help and they say, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. And so what do you do? You just step back and let them struggle and hope they can maybe do it. Or until they finally look at you and say, And then you're glad to step in and help them. But He gives grace to the humble. So understand that you have to come to the point where you realize that without Him, I can do nothing. It's really true. God, faith, when the Bible says the just shall live by faith, living by faith is living dependent upon God. God does not look for us to live independently of Him. Say, so, well, you Christians, you just use God as a crutch. Yes, I do. In fact, not His crutch, I think He's a whole wheelchair. I'm not getting around without Him. Okay? I, 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 I need Him every hour of every day. God doesn't, isn't about the independent living. And all, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. You know what that is? Dependence. Dependence on God. So, the source of the conflict is our pride and our prayerlessness and the seriousness of the compromise is the fact that it's infidelity and it's arrogance on our part. But let's see what he says. How do we correct it? We'll finish up. Here's the steps to correction. Verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You know, you remember the famous Charlie Brown, Lucy thing where she would always get down and hold the football for him. And Charlie Brown always come running up and he'd go to kick the football and what would she do? Pull it away and he'd go, Phew. right? And she gets the football out and says, come on Charlie Brown, I want you to kick the football. And he goes, I'm not going to kick the football. He says, I, I know how it always goes. I'm going to run up there. You're going to take it away. I'm going to fall on my face and I'm not going to do it. And uh, he, he, Lucy begins to weep. Begins to cry and say, I'm so sorry, Charlie Brown. I've seen the error of my ways. And, and I've seen the hurt it causes you. He says, and I, I promise you, I, 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 won't, I won't do it. Will you give this poor repentant girl one more chance? And of course, he, he succumbs and says, okay backs up and runs up to the ball and just as he's about to kick it, once again, 
She pulls it away and he falls flat on his back. And then here's the comment Lucy makes. As she walks away, she says, you know, recognizing your faults and actually doing something about them are two different things. Recognizing your faults and actually doing something about them is two different things, and they are. It's one thing to recognize you're doing something wrong. It's another thing to correct it. So it's one thing to recognize where the source of our conflict is and what the, what the consequences of those are, but now will you change it? Will you do something about it? And here's what he says we need to do. Number one, be submissive. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Christ can be in your life, but not in control of your life. Christ can be in your life, but not in control of your life. Just as it took an act of your will to receive Him as your Savior, I think it takes an act of your will to bow your knee to Him and say, Lord, take over my life. Control me. Yield to Him. Giving Him the permission to whatever He wants to do with our lives, He can do. Whatever it takes. I'll do what God wants me to do and I'll go where God wants me to go and I'll be whatever God wants me to be. He takes control. And listen, that ends the conflict in our life. It ends the, the, the what, what I'm trying to get done. What, what, what will I look to others? And what, what will I do about this? And what do other people think about me? I have nothing to do with that. I'm just yielded to Him. I'm going to do whatever He wants. When you don't depend on yourself to find life, to find satisfaction, to find purpose, to find meaning, and you find all those in Christ, when you, when you stop relying on yourself, the, the frustration you feel goes away. The anger you have goes away. You're simply doing what God wants. It's submission. But then he says, secondly, you have to not only be submissive, you have to be separated. He says, resist the devil, and he will f- flee from you. It's amazingly easy. Resist. Just, just stand up against him. And he'll... Go away. It's an amazing concept. Oh, the devil got me this week. Oh, the devil is doing this. Or how come the devil won't leave me alone? Because you're not resisting him. It's not rocket science. Just, just resist him. By the way, the problem is submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. The reason you're not resisting the devil is you haven't submitted yourself to God. When you decide that I'm still in charge and I'm still doing what I want, it's easy for the devil to have his way with you. What should Eve have done? Hey, God said it, get out of here. Period. End of conversation. No need to discuss it any further. But the devil is still... What was the devil trying to do? Hey... You don't need to just depend on what God says. You got to head think for yourself. Don't just do what the Bible says. Don't just do what God tells you to do. Come on, man. You ought to determine what's good and bad and what's right and wrong. Don't let God figure that out for you. The devil's still talking that way today. Live independent of God. Then, verse 8, draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. It says, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We have to reject sinful attitudes and actions. You, you, you submit yourself to God You resist the devil. He flees from you. Then you can draw nigh to God. If you don't submit 
and you don't resist, you'll never be nigh to God. You'll never feel close to God. You'll never be close to God. It won't happen. I want to be close to God. I want to feel God. How come I can't feel God? It's not, not a matter of you wanting to. But have you submissive to Him? Have you resist the devil? That's why he talks uh, here about mourning and weeping. Not to, not to make us miserable. He's not, he's not just saying to turn off the laughter and turn on the tears, but he's saying until you take this seriously, you're never going to find the answer to your conflict that's within you. Something stuck out to me last Sunday night as that young man brought the message about the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda. He'd been there how many years? 38 years. And when Jesus went up to him, he asked him a question, Wilt thou be made whole? We think, yeah, 38 years laying here. You know, some people, after they've been in a condition so long, they just want to stay that way. Brother Mike, working with homeless people, you're finding there's some people who just like it that way. We want something better for them. We know there's something better for them. But it's frightening to them because they've known this for so long, they don't know what that is anymore. And it's scary to them. But I'm afraid there's some Christians that have lived so long without God and not depending on God and relying on themselves and being independent and not being submissive and not resisting the devil that, you know what, that's kind of the only Christianity you know and you're just kind of happy to stay that way. Time to get serious. You have to be honest about the nature of the problem and be willing to accept God's solution. If you're not sober, you're not serious about it. Life isn't a big joke. Then God will give you His grace. And God will use you in amazing ways. He'll make bitter hearts sweet and ruin lives profitable. And He'll put an end to the conflict that's around you. And the conflict that's within you. And you'll stop hurting people and lashing out at people that are closest to you. And you'll have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Now, how do you know? It's interesting how he says, all right, how do, if I humble myself, verse 10, in the sight of the Lord, he'll lift you up. How will I know if that's happened or not? You know how you know that's happened? Verse 11 and 12. Notice what he said. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. He says, how do you know if you've done these things? How do you know if you've humbled yourself in the sight of God? It's the way you treat other people. You still speak evil and pass judgment on others? You haven't submitted to God. You haven't humbled yourself in His sight. You're not serious about being yielded to God if you're still passing judgment on other people. You're still looking down on other people. You're still speaking evil about somebody else. Boy, that's quiet. God, God doesn't mess around. Get serious here. This is, where, this is where rubber meets the road. We fight and we war because we do not submit ourselves to God. You'll never know peace till you allow the Prince of Peace to control your life. Yield. Yield to Him. If you're here today and you've never received Him as your Savior, my friend, 
It's the greatest decision you ever make in your life. You've been trying to figure out, I, I, I want to, hey, wouldn't you like to lay your head on your pillow at night and know that if that was your last breath or if there was some kind of an attack and you were taken, that you'd wake up in heaven? You can be absolutely certain of that. And the Bible gives you that answer. And it's through Jesus Christ. And knowing Him is your Savior. If you never made that decision, I urge you to make that decision today. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts now. I trust you have through your word today. Lord, I wish not just those in this room, though it has to start somewhere. I wish our whole country could hear this truth this morning. But Lord, if judgment begins, it'll begin at the house of God. It's always my people, which are called by my name, that you're concerned with. And that would be most of us in this room this morning. And so Lord, I pray that we would have numbers of Christians today who would say, I need to submit myself to God. I need to resist the devil. And I need to draw nigh to God and know that he'll draw nigh to me. I want to humble myself and receive his grace. God doing for me what I cannot do for myself. So I'll quit lashing out at others. I'll quit being frustrated. I won't have these contentions and these, these things that always are haunting me. But I'll have the peace of God and I'll know that I'm living dependent upon God every day. And Lord, if there's any in this room that has never received Christ as their Savior, may today be the day of their salvation. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. But right now with their heads bowed and just between you and God, how many folks in the room this morning can say, Pastor, you know, if I died this morning, I know for sure that I would go to heaven. There's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and I knew I needed a Savior and Jesus was the Savior I needed. And I did. I called on Jesus and from my heart I trusted Him as my Savior. And that's who I am trusting today as my Savior. Pastor, I know that I'm saved. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. All right, you may put them down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I, I don't know that for sure. I'll be honest. And God knows. You say, but would you let me pray for you? No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to call you out. But I certainly would like to pray for you. And would you just say, Pastor, I couldn't raise my hand the first time, but I'll raise it this time. And just, just pray for me. Remember me in prayer. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down that I could pray for you? Yes, I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else today? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Let me talk to believers here in just a moment. If God spoke to your heart today, about the source of the conflict and the seriousness of the compromise of being looking for the answers in the world and looking for the answers outside of Christ. about not being serious about the solution, yielding to the Spirit of God and submitting yourself to the Lord and resisting the devil and drawing nigh to God. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat this morning and I appreciate you praying for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, we'll pray and we'll have your invitation. Listen carefully. When I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Bob will sing. If the Lord has spoken to your heart today as a Christian, submit yourself to God. Just slip out from your seat into the nearest aisle. Come down and kneel at the altar. And just, just do what God's telling you to do in your heart. Bow the knee to Him. That's where it'll start. If you're here today and you slipped your hand up, even if you didn't slip your hand up, and you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. 
while others are coming to pray, just slip from your seat and come to the front. I'll meet you. We have people here who have been trained. They'll take a Bible. They'll show you from the Bible how you can know you have eternal life. I don't know if you'll have other opportunities to get saved, but I know you'll never have a better opportunity than you have right now. Don't pass it up. Don't pass it up. You come when they come and let someone show you from the Bible how you can know you're saved. Heavenly Father, I thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would help each individual to do what you're telling them to do in their heart. And that your will would be done in every heart and life this morning. Those who slipped their hand up and even maybe some who didn't. But you're dealing with their heart about salvation. I pray they'd come today and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, have your will and way now in every heart and life. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. If you would, please, as you stand, the pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing, God has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him this morning. That's right. Have thine own way, Lord. That's right. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now this morning. Lord, thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, we love you this morning, and we thank you so much for loving us and for meeting with us today, and thank you for the Bible and how, how, how relevant it is to the day in which we live. Now, Lord, I pray we dismiss this when, from this place, Lord, and that you will help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us to live the Bible we've learned. And Father, I pray you'd make us mindful of your presence with us as we go from this place and help us to please you in all we do. Give us a good afternoon. Prepare us for what you have for us in store this evening. And, and we ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right. Good to see the Rosses here today. Ronnie and Paula, glad you made it in. See Mark Bunner back. Mark's been gone for a while. It's good to have him here this morning. And it's Terry Yoder's birthday today 29 all over again right Dave married young and uh, 
Let's sing happy birthday to Terry Yoder today, all right? Let's do that. You got happy birthday over there? All right, let's sing for her. Everybody look at her, embarrass her real good, okay? <laughs> Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. There you go. And uh, have a great day. Spend her birthday in church. How about that? And uh, that's a good thing to do. All right. Uh, well, we prayed. We'll sing. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. See you this evening at church. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.